what I want to do is I'm going to check this with our radiograph and in this case what I'm going to do is going to take a, a GP cone, cut it to 50 and then place it at the point where we're getting zero on our apex locator and we can see here on our x-ray that it is is way way too short and you know we look at the x-ray here and we can maybe if we squint our eyes maybe we can see there's maybe a bit, of a bit of a crack but then this also could be the super imposition of the tip of the nose or even the lip and um, I've decided not to take a cone beam CT scan in this case but I'm going to do a working length check hello welcome to this Friday's uh, clinical case we've got another great one today um, and this is essentially a case where my apex locator wasn't working very well and you know if you've seen a lot of my cases you know that I think the apex locator is always king when we're thinking about checking our working lengths and things but in this case I'm gonna have to go straight back to basics straight back to the old school and I'm gonna use radiographs as well as an apex locator just to determine the uh, working length and also I want to show you a secret third way of determining the working length but before we get into the case First thing I want to say is, you know, we look at the metrics on the channel, we can see that around 40 to 50% of the people who watch these videos are not subscribers. So if you could just do one thing for me, it's very quick, very easy, and it's free, just hit that subscribe button. And if you want to take the support even further, then we've got our membership program on YouTube, um, the YouTube channel. Uh, if you join the membership program, you get early access to content, and now we've got exclusive content. So this is the case of an upper left one. This is a very young lady, early 20s, and she had, uh, uh, she's, she's got lots of horses, and the horse has head-butted her. And, um, you know, one thing I would say about root canal and being a root canal dentist is you just see so many horse accidents. It's just, just crazy, and you think to yourself, you'd never buy a horse in a million years just because of all the accidents but um, the, 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 the patient had suffered uh, uh, quite a bit of a knock to her upper right one and her upper left two however um, the patient came in for the consultation and we did some uh, special tests and vitality tests and the patient had already, had already had some vitality tests done with her normal dentist and it was suggested that maybe the upper right one um, was, was fine or it was healing and the upper left uh, two was fine but the upper left one hadn't uh, suffered the same fate I'm afraid so overall um, this uh, root this tooth needs a root canal and usually when they're partially necrotic or per partially uh, vital they've got a really really good chance of uh, survival but what we've got to think about is you know is there a crack in the, in the root so that's something we always need to take into consideration you know you could take a cone beam CT scan in this case but we'll talk about that later on in the video um, but when we look at the PA here you know it's it's not obvious if there is a crack so in the in in the sort of meantime we get on with the root canal or obviously warn the patient and we just be super super careful so we pick up the video here, we're going to access the tooth. Again, if you've joined the membership program, we've got uh, we've got uh, exclusive access to an access uh, uh, lecture. It's an hour long, it's fantastic, it shows you how to access all different types of teeth. But in this case, with an upper central, we're going to aim at the burr at a 45 degree, degree angle. And we're just going to just remove the burr, have a little look with our DG probe, and then we feel for that kind of drop into the, uh, the, 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 the pulp chamber. So we've got a, a small exposure here. And then once we know we've got uh, an exposure, we're going to try and open up this access cavity. But you just got to be really careful you don't damage the buccal aspect. Again, you can see here that I'm using ultrasonics, a little bit of um, uh, fast handpiece just to move it around. And then once we've made a substantial uh, uh, access in, in, in a tooth, I'm going to move over to my ultrasonics. Now, these are diamond tip special endodontic in, uh, ultrasonic instruments. They're not the ones that you would use on the normal chair. It does take a little bit longer, but it's safer. And we can see here that we've got this sort of necrotic pulp tissue here. So there's the sort of collagen fibers and, 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 and all the other sort of bits that make up the structure of the pulp uh, is still remaining. That hasn't completely necrosed yet. And we are just using a succession of fast hand pieces and ultrasonic tips just to create this kind of triangular shape here to make sure we've got a nice straight line access within the uh, within the tooth itself. And again, like I say, it could just take a bit longer, but um, now it's a little bit open. I'm going to try and dislodge the pulp a little bit here because 
what you'll notice here is I'm just removing some of the pulp from one of the pulp horns, which is quite satisfying, is that I want to try and remove this pulp in one because um, there's a real risk if I get, um, you know, a, a rotary file down there and it churns up this pulp, it churns up this collagen, it can create like a kind of a glue or a plug, which, you know, once you've sort of plugged up the uh, the, the root canal, it's, it's really, really difficult for you to remove uh, that, that type of pulp. So um, I spend a hell of a lot of time here just trying to refine the pulp to trying to dislodge the, the sort of pulp structure away from its, uh, from its walls. But, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm clutching at straws here. I'm just using the H-file to try and hook it up. Ideally, um, a, a barbed growth would be better in this case, but I don't really have any barbed brooches in the practice, so I'm doing my best here. And you know, it it really is quite loose this this pulp, and uh, maybe I'm just spending a little bit more time than I have to. But you know, with with these sorts of things, is you you're trying to remove the pulp, and uh, and you just think you, you just think, oh, it's just so loose. Maybe I could just dislodge it, and then you know, 20 minutes pass, and you think to yourself, you know, what are you doing with yourself? So. In this case, you know, I've got to the point where I'm just spending so much time on this tooth, I just need to just be getting on with the case. So what I've decided to do really is just use a bit of hypochlorite just to dissolve this um, this, this pulp uh, definitively. Once um, we have dissolved the pulp, you know, uh, the, the, we can see now that the access cavity needs to be refined a bit more. In this case, we need to sort of um, refine and remove the pulp horns. Obviously, I'm using these ultrasonic diamond tipped uh, tips, and this is just going to remove the undercut of the dentin, just open up the, the pulp chamber space as much as possible because we don't want to leave any necrotic tissue and also we want to make sure there's enough uh, space for us to uh, clean and whiten his teeth appropriately essentially. And, um, you know, it does take a lot of time, but it's safer to use these tips because, you know, sometimes if you're using a fast hand piece, you know, you've got little control compared to these diamond tipped ultrasonics. Obviously, you need a special unit, but, you know, if you're, if you're serious about dentistry, I'd, I'd get one. And then I'm just using a probe here just to check the undercut. And I can see here that we've removed, uh, you know, the, the, the undercut of the, the pulp horns. Once we've confirmed that the, uh, the the pulp horns have been removed, the next thing we need to draw our attention to is this palatal shelf. And this is, if you don't know what a palatal shelf is um, during access, this is kind of the hump that you get um, on the palatal aspect of the tooth. And if you remove this, when you come to obturate this tooth later on, this is gonna make it much, much easier to see down the, the canal space. And, and again, I'm using a, an ultrasonic tip in this case. You could use a, a fast hand piece, but you know, that's super, super risky business, I think. And then because I'm concerned about the remaining uh, pulp tissue, which is uh, seen here, I'm gonna uh, use a lot of hypochlorite and I'm gonna activate it quite early. So usually I like to activate it um, at the end, but in this case, I just wanna make sure I'm gonna dissolve uh, this this pulp as, 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 as quickly as possible. And then because I know that the canal space is clearly quite wide, I'm gonna go straight for my working length check with my apex locator. I'm using a size 15, I'm using a high diameter file because I know the apex is, is quite wide. And we can see here that we've got an immediate zero reading and this gives me a huge red flag. So in the first instance, I'm thinking maybe I've got too much hypochlorite in the canal space and this is touching the clamp, etc. But as we sort of aspirates the uh, hypochlorite out of this root it does bring it back a little bit but we're still looking like we're quite close to the end of the tooth and in fact you know when we get when we advance the file a bit further we're still kind of i would say not really in the vicinity of the length of this tooth so it could be the correct working length but i've got a gut feeling this is a little bit too uh, you know not a bit too short and of course when we remove the file we can sort of compare it to the next to the crown and it is too short so in the first instance um, what I'm going to now use is I'm going to use a high diameter file I'm concerned that maybe if this is an open apex then there's a possibility that the smaller diameter file might give us an erroneous reading but when we place uh, the 45 again to length we're getting that kind of same kind of reading and when we pull it out we can see that it's a uh, uh, 16.5 which is way way short and again this is kind of a little bit of a, a red flag for me I'm I'm slightly concerned maybe this tooth is cracked given the dental history 
And, um, you know, there's, a, there's an argument to say maybe I should be taking a Combium CT scan at this uh, this point. But what I want to do is I'm going to check this with our radiograph. And in this case, what I'm going to do is going to okay, take a, a GP cone, cut it to 50, and then place it at the point where we're getting zero on our apex locator. And we can see here on our X-ray that it is is way, way too short. And, you know, we look at the X-ray here and we can... Maybe if we squint our eyes, maybe we can see there's maybe a bit, of a bit of a crack. But then this also could be the superimposition of the tip of the nose or even the lip. And um, I've decided not to take a cone beam CT scan in this case, but I'm going to do a working length check in a more traditional sense using X-rays and GP cones. And I'm going to be taking each X-ray at different angles to try and catch uh, the, the, the crack, if indeed there is one. So what I decide to do in the first instance is I'm going to place just a normal uncut um, match GP cone to length and we can see that this is pushing about maybe 20, 22 and I'm getting that kind of tug back and maybe the, the apex is, is 25 so what I'm going to do is going to cut this off, take an x-ray and we can see that we're kind of in the vicinity here with this GP cone although the little bit of the GP cone has come out the end so we know we're kind of in the vicinity, but when I pull this uh, GP cone, um, it's, 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 it measures around uh, 25 uh, millimeters. So my aim here is to make an assessment of maybe the GP cones pushing out the end by about a millimeter. So I'm gonna cut this GP cone at 35. So it was 25, I'm gonna cut it to 35. This is gonna take off about a millimeter of the GP cone. I'm gonna place the GP cone, now cut GP cone uh, to length. It reaches about the same point on the incised ledge where we've cut it originally. So maybe this is gonna to get to a point where we get to the word correct looking length. But when we take the X-ray, the second cone fit, it's a little bit long. So now we know that the apical diameter isn't 35 and the working length isn't isn't 24. So in this case, you can see where we measured it. It's at 24. Maybe the working length is is going to be about 23, 23.5, and the apical diameter is definitely larger. So I'm just going to go up one. I'm going to cut it to 40. It was 35 before, remember? And then when I place this uh, cone to length, we can now see we're kind of in the kind of correct working length within the radiograph, and we can see that maybe it's slightly, slightly shorter than the radiographic apex, but we're, we're happy that this, of course, is within the canal space itself, and when we use our bioceramic, it's going to sort of fill this space up nicely and then when we remove the GP cone and we measure it we know there are 23 so now we know that the working length is 23 and the apical diameter is 40. We're going to use our final irrigation protocol we're going to use sodium hypochlorite we're going to activate it until it runs clear because remember when we activate things it sort of removes all the debris from the from the walls we're then going to use um, EDTA 70% activated and then we're going to use uh, our final rinse of sodium hypochlorite activated and both those times we're going to make sure it runs nice and clear. We're then ready to do our paper point drying okay I'm going to use these sort of high diameter paper points and what you'll notice here is this is another great way of checking the working length. I'm going to push my paper cone to length and I'm going to push it up to where the tweezers are uh, sort of crimping it. We're going to pull it out and we can see here now at the point where we've crimped it with our tweezers to the point where it becomes wet is about 23 millimeters. And this is a fantastic way of checking uh, physically the end of the tooth because obviously when the paper points out the end is going to get wet. What I would say is it's a bit risky business knowingly pushing a paper point out the end of a tooth because um, one of the greatest ways of making uh, the apex bleed is using a paper point. So that's another thing you need to take into consideration. We're then ready for our obturation. I'm going to measure the visco tip because I know that the canal space is quite wide and I'm going to make sure I'm going to directly inject the bioceramic almost all the way to the end of the apex but not too far but I don't want to be pushing this visco tip any further and uh, you know you only directly inject seal if you're using high magnification you can see here now that the canal space is all nice and filled up and then I'm going to use a sterile ham file this has been soaking in hypochlorite to introduce the sealer to the end 
of the, uh, the, 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 the canal space. And then I'm going to very, very slowly push the GP cone to lengthen. The problem with um, directly injecting uh, uh, a bioceramic within the canal space itself is you can get this thing called taper lock. So this is why we use this ham file to sort of break that air bubble. And then slowly pushing the GP cone to length is going to make sure the seal is sort of vents around it so if you push it down to length you're going to get that because kind of like bobbing up and down we're then going to shear off the excess uh, gp and then when we kind of shear off this uh, sort of excess gp sticking out i can kind of see that maybe there's a little bit of a space uh, between or a significant space between the gp and the bioceramic and i suppose in this case you know you could just condense it down but sometimes you can slip and you can get your um, sort of a Mac 2 plugger to push in between and it makes a bit of a mess. So in this case, I'm just using another GP cone just to push um, in between uh, just to make sure I'm filling it nicely so I can condense it down uh, effectively. And once we've, uh, you know, we've put our accessory cone in, shall we say, I'm just going to compact it down with a Mac 2 plugger. And before we come to fill this tooth, I'm going to just take a cone fit radiograph because it's at this point, you know, if you've made any mistakes or any voids, you can correct this really nice and easy. And we look at the post-op and it looks absolutely fantastic. It's all filled. We've got that kind of mushroom uh, shape at the end of the tooth. And I'm really, really, really happy with this obturation. Of course, we don't know why uh, the, the, the apex locator was firing off early maybe it was a lateral canal it's not obvious but i am happy with this and it's at this point we're going to make sure that the gp cone is cut at the correct length because if you are leaving too much gp above the cej that's going to stop you from uh, whitening this tooth safely because you need to cap over the uh, the gp cone with gi and also over a very very long period of time if you have gp within the coronal aspect of the tooth and it's going to uh, cause uh, more uh, risk of discoloration so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to use a mac 2 plugger with a rubber stopper on the end and i'm just going to push this into the canal space i'm going to measure to see where the gp cone is and then measure it outside of the tooth and i feel like maybe the gp needs to be cut down a little bit further this is of course to allow for the cap of gi and then I'm just, it's, you know, it's just a slow succession of uh, using a heater plugger just to slowly remove little bits of the GP, little bits of the GP. And then what we do is we use a Mac 2 plugger just to condense it, it condense it down. And then we just use the same test again. We're just going to, um, you know, put the Mac 2 plugger in place, adjust the stopper. And then when we push it from the outside of the tooth, we can see now we're kind of in the correct sort of depth. A little bit more compaction. And then we're going to clean it with our ultrasonic tip. Great thing about biostromic, it can be washed away with water. And then when we look at the, uh, the, the, the obturation, it looks really, really nice. And uh, we're ready for our, in this case, internal bleaching. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cap over the GP cone with some like your GIC. I use Vitribond. And I'm going to fill the, um, the coronal, uh, I'm going to fill the access cavity with whitening gel, a bit of PTFE. And, uh, and and GI, and then I'm going to review the patient in a week or so's time. And overall, that's the case. Thanks for watching. If you have any criticisms, or you think you could have done something better, or you've got any questions, please comment in the section below. Again, please like, and more importantly, subscribe to the channel. And if you want to bring you know your support even further, you can become a member, get early access to content, and of course, you can have uh, exclusive access to our endodontic access uh, lecture. See you next week in the next video.